That's right. It's giving me time to, uh, since we're in the snowman's land, giving me time to eat this delicious warm apple pie that Erin just brought up that she just made, because apparently that's what we decide to do when it's a thousand degrees no, outside. No eating while podcasting. What do you think you are, John Roderick? No eating mm-hmm. while podcasting. Hey, did you hear anything up until I admitted it? Nope. Have Have you yet spilled any apple pie into your iMac? No. That would be quite an impressive uh, feat, though. It really would. I mean, I just feel like eating and podcasting do not mix. Well, that's what meat button's for. It feels like we just got off the phone, like we just got off of Skype for the last episode. and <laughs> It really honestly does. Here we are again, two nights later. <laughs> yeah, 48 hours later, almost to the minute. Um, I barely published the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> so as we record, it is uh, Friday evening, the 22nd of July, and um, one of us is skipping town next week, and so we're recording early because we're dedicated to you, our listeners, and don't want you to go any time, or any weeks, I should say, without a new episode of this Accidental of Podcasts. And so we are recording very shortly after the last show and did not have a lot of time to uh, accumulate follow-up. That being said, as always, we do have some for you. Do we want to dive right in, gentlemen? Let's do it. Let's start with the dog rental. The, which was the um, namesake for the last episode, uh, free to free to play dogs, or was yeah, that's right. Um, anyway, the internet is written in to, to correct us um, and is referred to the um, the true gift to humanity that is Snopes dot com, which says uh, <laughs> the the title they used was Pika Q, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, they correct us in the story that we told about the animal shelter and the dogs. Um, To quote from Snopes, claim, a shelter rented dogs for embarrassed adult Pokemon Go players and raked in tons of cash for all their dogs were swiftly adopted. Mostly false. What's true? The Muncie Animal Shelter of Muncie, Indiana, enacted a novel Pokemon Go dog walking program inviting locals to walk shelter dogs during their gaming sessions. What's false? The shelter didn't charge players $5 an hour per dog to scare quote rent dogs for well so it was free to play that's the fair point <laughs> rent dogs for walking uh they were not ran- uh, rapidly cleared of dogs for adoption nor did they make megabucks off a program designed to harness a gaming phenomenon to get shelter dogs some time outside so um that was all a bunch of bs for the most part but it's still an adorable story and i'm i'm kind of glad we talked about it anyway yeah so two things on this first i intentionally didn't retweet people pointing us to the snopes because i wanted to give people like a week to think it's real of course it doesn't work if we record (laughs) two days after the previous one the people who aren't (laughs) listening to the live stream i want to give them i mean maybe you guys already rt'd it so that's that's too bad i did not i didn't have the heart i i want to give people a week to to believe like i'm like when we preface this in the past uh, the last show we're like you know who knows if this is true it's on the internet blah blah blah. but it sounds like a good story and that's uh, of course all the things that are made up on the internet sound like a good story that's how they spread um but i like to give people a week to think it was real because it's a, it was a nice heartwarming story and the second uh casey referred to snopes as like the gift of the internet or whatever it used to be a lot more than it is now the snopes website is pretty grim pretty pretty grim like it is not a nice place to be. I was scrolling through this story, and there's like this picture of maggots at the bottom. That's part of one of those terrible ads, and everything is like blinking oh, and moving. Oh God! Yeah, you're right. No, it's not. A, it's not a good sign. I don't know what happened to it. You feel like, uh, like uh, IMDb or what? I mean, IMDb has gotten worse too. But like, you, you think these old sort of things that were around a long time ago that have value that sort of are category defining websites should have found some way to to make it work without making their sites more and more gross over time but but alas but that's just that's just the web these days i mean it's it isn't like snopes is run by horrible people i mean i don't know who runs it but it's not just the web these days no it really is it isn't it's just just your in your cynical view that you think every website is doomed to this fate but that's not true there are websites that are not like this like i said even imdb which has gotten worse in terms of usability but hasn't become festooned with ads and viruses and pictures of maggots and there's a pro version that you can pay for that gets rid of a lot of that crap. Like, that's the way you do it. Or Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not, you know, it doesn't have tabula of whatever ads at the bottom of it. It's got what's-his-name's face coming down asking you for money. But still, uh, it's not, you know, if this is not the ultimate fate of every website. This is the fate of websites that are slowly going circling the drain. It's It's very hard to monetize a website in 2016 that doesn't have a very particularly targeted audience like Snopes. Um, in ways that aren't horrible, like it, it. This is this is not like a gradual progression that happened over the last twenty years. This is a very rapid progression that happened over the last like three years. Uh, it's been it's been very recent and very quick with with the 
the uh, massive shift in traffic of like where traffic comes from going all the way into Facebook, uh, a ton of of desktop browsing going away, being replaced by either phone browsing or just not browsing websites and just spending more time on social networks instead. Um, and, th- and then of course all the, you know, robo ad networks and all the problems that go along with those, like the horrible ads and the massive fraud problems. And I mean, it, it's a tough business now to try to make money by just having an ad supported website. It's very, very hard. It's nearly impossible for most sites to do it in a way that they can both afford to have any kind of staff quality at all. And also have a site that is not very focused, uh, you know, audience wise. So it can't get very expensive ads. And that is not just full of horrible crap like that. I mean, look around, how many websites do you see that are really in great shape these days that that have a staff of more than like two people it's it's really hard to find any yeah but all all, all the more reason that like the well-known sites have a leg up because they're like where does everybody go for movie stuff imdb right i mean amazon bought them already so they basically have already been saved by their plans but you know uh, it's it's not impossible and if it's, it's if it's going to be more difficult now than it used to be or whatever the ones that have the most advantage are the ones that are already established genre defining categories even slash dot never got this bad or isn't this bad now <laughs> because i believe it still exists well yeah all slash dots trash is in their comments uh, fair point <laughs> uh so what about like the sweet home for example that's not festooned with terrible ads all over the place now to be fair they are they, they appear to be pretty reliant on affiliate amazon affiliate money and uh ghostery is reporting what looks at a glance to be uh 20 different trackers that they're using <laughs> on the site yeah but, i mean, I mean the, it is basically a shopping site so it's different like wh- if you're a shopping site you can make money off of affiliate stuff or off of the profit of things you're directly selling it's very different for you know something like snopes which is like a very basic content site you know you make money off of page views period and it is really hard to get anything good there these days um especially when you are both big and untargeted like snopes is snopes should be no different than wikipedia though because the same thing wikipedia is general purpose there's no confined audience it's extremely broad it's a simple site that just contains text and yet Wikipedia not festooned with ads or viruses. Well, Wikipedia also, you know, first of all, it is donation funded by a, what seems like a pretty large amount of people. And even then, they still have to put the giant Jimmy Wales head on top of the, on top of Wikipedia in what seems like a very uh, increasing frequency. Yeah. Uh, but that also, I, I'm pretty sure that they have a pretty small staff of actually paid people. Um, and are, they're probably also a nonprofit, right? Well, how many people do you think Snopes needs? I don't think it needs a, a, a gigantic staff of, of people. I mean, they could they could leverage volunteers. Well, I, this this is not a site where people have to file seven stories a day about. It's not like a gaming site or something. There are much harder categories than Snopes. It just feels like a shame that Snopes is exactly one of those sites that because it's mostly purely text and it's a simple site and it shouldn't require a giant staff. And they're not you know uh, reviewing cars or sending people to trade shows or doing anything else that costs a lot of money up front. It you know it's just a shame that it is like and and because it's still popular people still link to Snopes I wish it had been replaced by like a Stack Overflow versus Quora equivalent where the crappy site gets replaced <laughs> by the better one but instead we all just go to Snopes and it just every time we do it gets worse well and you know it's also possible you know we don't we don't know that the Snopes owner who owns Snopes is it some big company or is it just kind of its own thing the maggots own Snopes now yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know they could just be really tired of running it and just maximizing profit for a while too like that is also a possibility here but i, I think it's more likely that they are a, a, at least partially a victim of the problems that all web publishers face these days with trying to get any money out of ads in an age where almost everybody browses on phones almost all traffic comes from facebook and almost nobody clicks on ads on phones by the way so you have to make money in other creepy ways and also the ads that you're selling are being sold by decreasingly few brokers with decreasing prices fair enough all right and uh to bring this back to pokemon uh he wrote in (laughs) to say hey this this is the rules you got to get through the follow-up before we move on uh he wrote in to say my friend was very excited to play pokemon go with her seven-year-old son she excitedly installed it and said let's go out and play but he was quick with his rebuttal no mom pokemon is for old people sad times just like that we're all old all over again it's kind of true like uh you look outside there was a couple stories about this about uh nintendo targeting uh people in in generational waves like if you played pokemon as a kid now you're ready to play it on your smartphone because 
had the same situation with my family. You realize that if your kid doesn't have a smartphone, it's very difficult to play Pokemon Go without at least one person with a smartphone that you can tether to because you do have to be on the move with internet access at the same time. And seven-year-olds don't have a device, a portable device with internet access that they can walk around the neighborhood with. They, they would have to go. I mean, they should be going with a parent anyway. But like when I look, when I see all those pictures, look at all these people, they're all playing Pokemon Go. I don't see... 50% kids. I don't even see 25% kids. I see maybe like 5% kids and 95% uh, young adults and adults. So it is a game for old people. Uh, I don't think Nintendo cares. Old people have money, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see. Although it, they're finally, uh, Nintendo is making public statements trying to deflate his own stock price. Now they're like, do you realize we don't make that much money from this? Like we get a license fee <laughs> and the actual money goes to this other company? Like, Please. it's great that you doubled our stock price but perhaps you don't understand how this works we're not getting uh as rich as you think we are delightful all right any other follow-up for 48 hours later no actually we we did get uh one really nice note uh from a person named cap cap said hi one thing that's great about apple not updating the mac for ages there's never been a better time to buy a mac second hand a few months ago, I managed to pick up a 2011 iMac with a uh, SSD installed for an absolute bargain, added a bunch of USB 3 ports via Thunderbolt dongle, and couldn't be happier. Uh, it isn't just that this, this machine was ridiculously cheap. I also didn't feel like I'm missing out on anything besides Retina by not getting a new Mac. Uh, and this is, I thought this was a really good point, because like when you see that the entire lineup uh, in, certain, in, in certain families, if not the whole Mac lineup, has not changed that much in like three years... That means you can buy a three-year-old Mac, and it's still pretty competitive with the with the brand new ones that are coming out today. Uh, and you know, th- it's a mixed bag. Uh, obviously, we'd like things to be getting better over periods of three years in the computer industry. But as long as they're getting better so slowly uh, or not at all, then you know, like you could pick up like a three-year-old Mac Pro that's almost out of warranty now <laughs> for probably a decent price, and it's still the same machine being sold new you know more more realistically you know you, most people wouldn't be doing that but most people could get this, get similarly great deals on like a MacBook Pro you know you can get the first generation Retina MacBook Pro is from 2012 that's now 4 years old and it's not that different from the ones they're selling brand new still today like it isn't that much slower you know you might you might have to replace the battery if it's worn out but these you know lithium poly batteries don't wear don't wear out that quickly uh so like you can really get amazing deals on like three to five year old Macs now that are almost as good as the ones they are still selling brand new today. I have trouble bending my mind in such a way that this is actually a good thing. Like I know some people can, you know, like I'm not missing out. It's it's not much worse than what you could buy new, but it is still a really old and really slow computer. It just so happens that you can't even buy one that's that much better, but it doesn't change like in absolute values, the state of that old machine. And also it may not change like Apple's sort of deprecation window of like you know like my mac pro and a bunch of other machines don't have support for uh, mac os sierra and stuff i'm not sure that window apple's sort of sliding window of dropping old hardware support for os's takes into account the fact that apple is not making their computers much better so i think that window moves along whether apple releases new macs or not which is kind of sad and really you're right it's not they're not that much worse than the current ones and in some cases you can find a machine that's that's a couple of years old that has some attributes that are actually a little bit better than the current machines but all you're doing is putting yourself even farther back so that when the new Macs inevitably do come back, like the, the gap will suddenly widen because we all presume Apple will continue to produce Macintoshes in the future at some point. Um, and when they come out, suddenly, the, you know, the, 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 the feeling that you have is like, oh, this is such a bargain. It's such a good deal because the gap between you and the best available is small. The gap between you and the best available is about to take a giant leap. And that's not going to feel too good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, I can I can see where this person is coming from, but my to my mind and my personality, I think it's even worse to buy a used one now. Um, it's kind of like if Apple was rapidly advancing, you could get a used one that is better in terms of absolute value, just because they're going forward so quickly that uh, you'd end up with a better machine. But like, oh, it's, I, I think it's bad all around. But maybe I'm just sad about this well i mean i suppose you could look at it the 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 most horrible way which is if you buy a brand new machine from apple today you're basically buying a three-year-old machine (laughs) for a brand new price (laughs) that's what i'm saying like save like save your money rather than don't buy you don't buy a new one 
don't buy a used one. Just keep putting money into your little buy a Mac later fund so that when they do come out with new ones, you can get a fancier one. Sure. But if you if you need a Mac now and you need one for like, I don't know, 700 bucks, like what do you really like? And especially if, if the Mac mini is not going to suit your needs, which at 700 bu- at 700 bucks, it almost certainly won't. And even if even with infinite money, it might not. If you really want a laptop, which almost everybody does these days, uh, you know, it, if you have that kind of budget and you know, a good MacBook or MacBook Pro is going to cost you nearly two thousand um, well, dollars. You know, once it's optioned reasonably, then that's a pretty good option to you know get a three year old one for you know basically you know get today's Mac for what it's actually worth today, which is a three year old one's price. Yeah, if I had a business and I absolutely had to buy one because like new employees were coming on board and we didn't have computers for them, I might buy a use, the cheapest used one I could possibly get with the idea that I will buy a new one also, like as soon as they come out. Because that that is probably like, what's the least amount of money we can spend now to get a computer on your desk that you can use while we wait for the new Macs to come out, knowing that as soon as they do, we're going to resell those used ones and get a new one for you. That, that makes sense to me. I mean, you could you could probably get a used 101 for the same price it'll cost to upgrade the new one to one terabyte. Mm, yeah, don't, don't remind me. <laughs> <sighs> we are sponsored this week by Trunk Club. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Go to trunkclub.com slash ATP to get started. Shopping takes forever, and nobody has time for it. Now it's summer, so you probably need a solid pair of shorts and some swimwear for all your offshore activities. And it'd be nice to have somebody else pick out all these things for you. With Trunk Club, you never have to set foot in a store, and you get your very own stylist for free. And again, this is not like a bot stylist. This is not like a little window on a website that you type into, and you kind of wonder, is that even a human on the other side, or is it a bot? This is an actual human that they contact you, and you you get assigned one person, and they're real. They really exist. They're a real person. You, you know their name. They know your name. You send them your measurements and everything. And they and you, just, you know, tell them your preferences, what kind of stuff you like, what kind of stuff you don't. And they make it easy to look your best by sending you clothes that will fit you perfectly. They handpick them. The stylist handpicks them for you. What, you know, they have your measurements and everything else. They pick clothes from over 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. And here's how this works. You request from them a shipment of clothing whenever you want one. Whether you want it to be simply on demand whenever you ask, you can have them send it to you once a, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, whatever you want. So it isn't like a subscription where you're just paying every month no matter what you use. You, you tell them when you want them to send you a trunk full of clothes, and they will send it to you. And then you can try things on for up to 10 days in your home, and then you just keep what you want to keep, and they charge you for that. And you send back anything you don't want. So it's totally risk-free. This is premium clothing being sent to you by a real personal stylist with your measurements and preferences in mind. This is not just another way, another way to shop online because this is all human-driven. And it's risk-free. They send you stuff right to your door. You try it on. You keep what you like. You send back the rest. And you only pay for what you keep. So make a statement today at the next big event on your... That doesn't make sense. Make a statement at the next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started at Trunk Club today. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Go to trunkclub.com slash ATP. That's trunkclub.com slash ATP. Thanks a lot. I talked a lot about this on a recent episode of Reconcilable Differences that I think is not out yet, so I don't really have that much to retread about it here, although... Honestly, I'm not sure how much overlap there is in the audience between those two shows, so maybe we'll just say all the same things again in true Marco fashion, where he says he doesn't have anything to say about a topic and then just says everything over again. Um, <laughs> so this topic is uh, Twitter. Uh, Twitter's little verified check mark that mm-hmm. uh, historically people have had. If you're a super important celebrity and people want to know, like, is this the real Cheryl Crow? And you look at their little Twitter profile and it shows a little check mark, and you're like, oh, it must be the real one, and not the million parody impersonation accounts or whatever. Of which there are many. How did you land on Cheryl Crow as your exam- example? Oh, for I don't know. I was trying to think of a celebrity. Like, who do the kids know these days? <laughs> Not <laughs> Cheryl no. Crow. Is I Cheryl Crow the most recent celebrity you can come up with? <laughs> It's free association. No, it's not the most recent, but like, I mean, I guess I could have gone with Taylor Swift. I mean, I don't know what you. Anyway, that's what the check mark has been for historically. And I think we've talked about this topic before how it would be much better if that kind of 
attestation where Twitter says, yes, we are telling you that this is actually the person you think it is, if that was available to many more people, because it's not just celebrities that suffer from accounts that impersonate them and otherwise uh, make their lives miserable by people mistaking um, them for somebody else, just put like different Unicode characters or capital I instead of an L or like whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't understand that that much because you could just right click on your web browser and fake a screenshot much easier than making a fake Twitter account. But anyway, <laughs> um, the second aspect of this is because, because it historically been celebrities that get to have this check mark. Uh, Twitter has rolled out a, a series of like different views and tools and filters and features in their official client that are only available to people who are verified with the idea being they have so many followers and have so many replies to go through. They need extra tools to deal with their stuff. And again, uh, a lot of people who deal with harassment and other problems on Twitter could also use those tools, but, oh, they're not important enough to get verified. Um, and so I think in our last uh, conversations about this, uh, I was saying, and uh, so I think you two were agreeing that, like, verification should be available to everybody. Um, and we understand that it takes time and possibly money to verify because they, they like, look at your, they need, like, a state ID or they, they basically need to check that you really are you. And that takes time and a human being has to do it and that costs money. Or like just charge a fee for it. If it, if it costs you money, we're not saying Twitter you have to give this away for for free. Charge a nominal fee because pretty much everybody I know who desperately wants to be verified for actual for a purpose, you know, to to get the tools or to deal with harassment or to make sure that they're not impersonated, would gladly pay a nominal fee. To I mean, they'll throw the money at you in two seconds to get a, the little check mark that says yes, I really am who I am. Why is this limited to celebrities? Why not open it to everybody? So in theory. Recently, Twitter has changed its rules in the light of the whole Ghostbusters abuse thing. And, all, all you know, one of the stars of Ghostbusters got chased off Twitter by a bunch of terrible people. Um, I don't know if that was the impetus behind this move, but, it, you know, timing wise, it sure looks like it. Twitter verification is now open to anybody who wants to fill out an application on Twitter's website. You fill in a bunch of fields. You try to have to tell them why you think you should be verified. If you're a brand or a company, you can check a checkbox for that. If you're an individual, you tell them, like, here's all the places where you can see who I am. Here's why I should be verified. And then it goes into a big black hole. And in theory, they come back and say, yes, you're verified or no, you're not. Um, and this comes up specifically as it relates to this show because... Marco, Marco's been verified for a long time, right? You were, were you verified in like the, the very beginning? This is the thing. I was, I, I got verified like three weeks ago or something. It was, it was really recent. I thought you'd been verified for a long time. No, like I, I started ranting about there was some when, oh, it was when the, uh, when, what was that app? Engage? What was that app they launched a couple weeks ago that we were all made fun of? Oh, like the celebrity only, uh, yeah. app to like see who, what people are saying about your tweets or whatever. It's like ego surfing. Yeah. I mean, anybody could use it, but yeah, I mean, and I actually use it for a few, for a few days on my phone to kind of try it out. Um, but when that launched, I was, I was basically ranting about how like, you know, this app gave special privileges to verified people in the, in the way that like, not, not as verified people using the app, but if you were verified, you your tweets would show up in these filtered views higher than non-verified people. And it was just like yet one more thing that was, you know, because the verified system has, you know, having a system like this has lots of problems and inequalities inherent in it. You know, it, it's one thing if it's only for identity verification. But once you add any other, like, bonus features or higher statuses, once you attach those to verified status, it makes this program something that should be available to everybody. Because then it's like, well, you know, if verified people get their tweets seen more in certain filters or get higher priority things or get certain abuse control filters that that other people don't get, I mean, everybody should be able to be verified. That because then that's then it's a feature segment, not like a a status thing. And and to tie status to also like abuse control features and relevancy in search sheets and stuff is that's kind of that, that's kind of icky, you know. So I was ranting and raving about that, and and a nice person um, who worked at Twitter uh, submitted me, uh, but it seems like that's just been open to the public now, and that's great, uh, sort of. It's great in that okay, well now a lot more people can get verified, but it still is subject to some kind of like importance judgment on on the side of whoever's reviewing these forms um because we know like for example uh, federico vatici got rejected which is insane by the way it completely mm -hmm. a person who is like he has his own website a popular website that's been around for years it yeah. is like i'm not gonna say a pillar of the community but it's not an obscure place he's not an obscure person and he's not even like just 
like a random person who happens to have a blog like this is years and years of of working in like if if he doesn't i he should be verified under the the old pass where twitter went around to all the websites that like all like the tech websites or whatever and said hey here you go anybody who works for your website can get a check mark he didn't get one then and the fact that he got rejected now makes no sense exactly because yeah because like for you know they they always uh you know they they had a lot of rule shifts over time of what kind of people would get verified initially when it first started it was basically like people who had the most followers on twitter and they kind of like worked their way down the follower count until they got just above my number of followers and they stopped and then they (laughs) said and then then it was okay well now we're just going to do like you know public figures like celebrities politicians and people who work for the media and that was kind of loosely defined the media uh it always meant whatever kind of media i didn't do so it was like you know not just bloggers and not podcasters uh and not app developers but if you work for like a journalism thing whatever however they define that and it was it it, these these definitions always shifted and were very vague and really very much based on like does some handful of people at twitter think you're important this month uh and then it was it was weird it was like if you worked for you know if if they declared a certain website or publication to be like a verifiable publication anybody who worked for them would get verified in like this big batch that they would do and so like you you'd have people who like wrote one article for for like a paper somewhere they have like 400 followers and they're verified and then you have people who have like 50,000 followers who can't get verified it's just it's a, it was always a weird system and it's always been these kind of like vaguely defined very like human judgy kind of clarification like like, i I know like uh one of our friends reached out uh about a year ago to see to try to get the three of us verified and they told because you know he knew a guy who knew a guy and the response was we don't consider podcasters to be media personalities at this time and youtubers were getting it but podcasters weren't it's just like again like it's always been this weird system and it's it's always kind of rubbed me the wrong way and that's why i started complaining and eventually i complained enough that i got verified and i made a joke when i got verified that you know now that i got it in like three weeks they're going to just end the program and they didn't instead they just open up to everybody which i guess is better <laughs> well a, a couple things of that so your complaint was originally hey it's like you said it's it's stupid to tie features and things that a lot of people could use to this whole vague status thing right exactly and I'm not saying that whoever was to help you speaks for all of Twitter, but what happened was not, hey, you know, Marco, you have a point. We should change the way we do things. Instead, it was, hey, you know, Marco, if we give you a check mark, will you shut up? Like, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that's the <laughs> yes. that's, that was the intent or whatever, but like, it, it it basically the person who did this for you is not empowered to change Twitter's policy, right? So they can't like it's not the CEO that did this for you. I'm assuming, right? Um, so they just tried to do the nicest thing they could to make you feel better, which is a good customer service move. And it's like, I can't actually solve your problem, but how about if I do this to make you feel better? And like, you know what? It kind of does make me feel a little better, but <laughs> it didn't do anything to, to solve the actual problem because the person who cared about this was obviously not the CEO or anyone in a position to solve the problem. Um, and as for the, the media things, uh, to, to reinforce your point that anybody vaguely associated with the media thing could get one when uh, the Twitter checkmark fairy came to Ars Technica. It was offered to everybody, <laughs> including to me. And I am one of those people who writes like one article a year. I didn't have 400 followers. But, you know, I, I was not a, a my contribution to Star Technica, though they may have been large in size, were few in number. Um, and I was offered a checkmark. And I didn't take it because part of the conditions were you would be getting a checkmark as part of Ars Technica. So you had to use your Ars Technica email to be associated with it. And I didn't want a checkmark as part of Ars, A, because I didn't feel like I was part of Ars. Like I was a freelancer. I'm not I don't have any sort of st- you know, stake in the company. I'm not even a full-time employee. I never have been, right? And B, I didn't want to check mark as part of Ars Technica. I, because I'm a giant egomaniac or whatever, wanted to be recognized <laughs> for myself. And if you don't want to recognize, give me a check mark for being me, then fine. I don't want one. Like, I don't, I don't want to be on Ars Technica's coattails or whatever. So, for multiple reasons, I turned that one down. And I figured, like, look, well, you know, if, if I'm never going to check mark, I'm never going to get a check mark, right? Uh, but this whole thing of, like, whatever i I wish you could find the press release or whatever it was opening it up to everybody the application process may be open up to everybody but as vitici shows it's not as if they opened up the check mark to everybody not only do they not open it up to everybody but their definition doesn't make any sense because it's maybe it's a slightly broader definition but if vitici doesn't fit under the definition then i shouldn't get a check mark either 
Um, and I don't like that because I want a check mark, and that's that's why this topic is here. <laughs> because beyond all reason, I want a stupid check mark. And as I whined about at length on reconcilable differences, I don't need a check mark like the people who actually need it. People who are actually the targets of harassment who need these tools. People who have huge number of accounts impersonating them. And just I mean, Bri- Brianna Wu is the the poster child for this. Like. The fact that she doesn't have a check mark now makes no sense. She's constantly yeah. in touch with Twitter, sending them hundreds of reports, getting accounts banned, and no one rec- at the receiving end of this flood of like reports of abuse of Twitter goes, you know what might help this person? Maybe we should make her verified. And she has a huge number of followers too. Like every criteria that you could possibly think of, like for someone who's like not a publication or whatever, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm frustrated with the, these strange rules. I'm frustrated that even under the strange rules, I still don't have one. Uh, and yes, I did apply. I applied on Wednesday. I had to fill in a bio, which I had never filled out on Twitter intentionally, <laughs> because again, with another ten minutes of whining about this and reconcilable differences, it's impossible <laughs> to write a bio that doesn't sound god awful. So I just wrote a god awful bio. If you go look on twittercom Syracuse right now, you'll see my god awful bio. I had to put a uh, birthday. I already had a header image. I, and when I did the application, I was worried that they would get yelled at for my header image. My header image is a picture from the video game Journey, which I love and everyone should play and no one should get be spoiled about. Um, and it's like a, a like a wallpaper that you could download from Sony's website, but technically it contains like copyrighted images or whatever. Like, I mean, if you go to the Sony site, it's like, hey, if you're just in Journey, come here and here are wallpapers. And that's one of the wallpapers. So I assume it's free for me to take and put as my header image. I don't even know. Anyway, I filled it out. I have not heard back from them. Everyone else is tweeting, hey, I entered a, th- a thing into the application and I heard back and I'm verified and I have a check mark. All sorts of check marks, blue check marks are sprouting everywhere. And honestly, I shouldn't care. All I should care about is that the people who actually need check marks get them. And by the way, those people still aren't getting them, which I don't understand. But anyway, you need one, John. You need one. Yep. I'm not getting one either. This is like the good version of a Wikipedia page because everyone thinks they want a Wikipedia page, but anyone's heard me talk about Wikipedia knows. I have many problems with Wikipedia. I don't want a Wikipedia page. It's a curse more than a blessing. But but a check mark, it's basically only upside uh, and no real downside. <laughs> and anyway, I don't have one. Let me tell you why you want one. I mean, because like, you know, why I want one, you know, because we're all egomaniacs, first of all. Yep. But like you can look at it from like the original purpose of verified. And it's kind of like the lock icon on an SSL site. You know, like getting a little lock icon in your address bar. First of all, you can que- it's worth questioning, like, is that even effective? Because we know, we know very much that the lock icon and address bars has never been very effective because nobody goes to check it. Uh, and all the web browsers keep updating their designs to more and more emphasize the security level of the site that you're on uh, or to put up even crazier and scarier warnings if something is not quite right. And yet people still get fished all the time and still enter their stuff into insecure forms and everything. So we, we know that that kind of warning doesn't really work for the most part for most people because most people just don't think to check that kind of thing or they don't know to check that kind of thing. And even if they know, they sometimes forget and just miss it. Whether it serves an original purpose is kind of, it's not that relevant because that original purpose is not a very strong purpose what it really is is jewelry it, it, it is it is a a prize it is it is a, a sign awarded to you that says i am important and because it is emphasized everywhere you're seeing those big blue check marks on all these important people in your timeline so it is very much a status symbol and whether whether you need or want the additional filtering features it brings you want to be a special person and honestly when i got it I have almost felt like a responsibility has been granted to me, and I have to like tweet more responsibly now. It's weird. Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> how, wait, how does one go about tweeting more responsibly? What are, you, what are you not tweeting that previously you would have tweeted? It's 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 like getting like a like a BS title at work to try to like make you more responsible. Like, it has totally worked on me. Where like I'm like, well, you know, I'm like representing this blue check mark now. I I, I better you know. You know, it, it's like how like cops aren't supposed to like you know drink at bars in their uniforms. You know, I kind of I kind of feel like you know I I gotta like you know be good for this check mark and be on be on better behavior now. Because you because you can't say that it's not really Marco. That's not that really me. That's an impersonator. No, it just it kind of feels like I've been blessed with this honor that I have to like treat well. I don't know. It's it does it's not rational, but that's how it feels. Well, for what it's worth, the there's an account which is at verified. Uh, this uh, the, this is an account on Twitter that, from what I can tell, follows every verified account 
and it follows 190,014 accounts as we record. One of those accounts, ladies and gentlemen, is this guy. Because guess who got his blue check mark a couple days ago? I did. And man, John, does it feel good? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's not bad. So the thing that burns me up so much about your check mark is that you <laughs> oh, got here it, we go. <laughs> is that you got it six hours after filling out the application. Like you filled out the application not too long before I did. Like basically, I didn't fill it out because I was too busy podcasting with Merlin while trying to fill it out, which is why we ended up talking about it. Um, and so when the show was over, I filled it out. You filled it out, and you said, what, six hours later, you got your check mark? Yeah, it was a little after noon on whatever day it was announced. And it was just before I recorded um, the latest episode of Analog that I received it. And so we actually talk, Mike and I talk about this on Analog uh, as well. But yeah, it was somewhere around six or seven hours. It's like showing up to like a really popular event just after the whole crowd gets there. Like there's a line of five people, and then you, <laughs> then you wait 15 minutes, then there's a line of 3,000 people. So now I'm somewhere back in a queue. I just assume I'm going to get rejected because that would fit perfectly with the completely <laughs> arbitrary pattern of like not giving Vitici one, rejecting Vitici, and just never responding to Brianna. Like it fits perfectly with, with the, the whole notion that is just like – a hamster in a wheel over there or some kind of random number generator and no actual human with any kind of judgment is doing this because honestly if there was anybody with any kind of judgment doing this like not giving verified check marks immediately to every single target of gamergate like i, I don't i don't understand the meeting where you'd be like should we do anything about this and should we give them check no let's just not ever do it for like a year does that sound good guys okay good let's break for lunch like i don't i don't understand the logic i don't even <laughs> understand the neglect i don't understand and how can it be staffed to such a degree that Casey's wait time is six hours and that they, they give him a thumbs up and yet all these other people don't get them? I, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, I totally recognize that this entire topic and conversation is obnoxious and that I shouldn't care. <laughs> um, but we do care because they made us care. They manipulated us into caring about these blue check marks. Yeah, there are some le- some legit reasons that, that that a regular person would want this, like people who don't need it like me. Like I said, because you get you get more features that make Twitter nicer to use. And I think your thing of the lock icon is great. It's just like I want my account to seem trustworthy and to people not to think it's me. And I have had a few impersonators who I've reported and their accounts have gotten closed. And it's like whatever. Like it's not I don't have any any actual issues. But it, put it this way. If they literally opened it to everybody with 10 bucks, I would pay 10 bucks in a second. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like, like I, I registered the Overcast account for it, and I, I, I signed up, or I, I filled out the form roughly the same time you did, I think, John, and I haven't heard back from that either. It's still pending. Um, but I did it for for basically that reason of, like, I wanted the Overcast Twitter account to appear, you know, official, to really make it look like this is a real business for a real app that, that matters in the world because it's good enough to get a blue check mark. Like, I want people to see that. That is, that it, it, it helps look more professional. I mean, we're, we're going to do the same thing for the ATP account, a, uh, ATP FM on Twitter. I want people to know that that's the official account of the show. And so a check mark would be good to give them the reassurance that they're like, what was the ATP one? Because it's not just at ATP because that's a different one and you might not be sure. And again, I, like I, it's a thing I think should be open to everybody as in if you have $10, boom, you've got a check mark. No, like a mechanical process with no humans involved except for the verification part. And that's what you're paying your $10 for. But like the idea of being rejected for verification doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is weird. Um, With that said, in my, what is this, like three or four days of living the sweet, sweet, sweet blue checkmark lifestyle, uh, I've only noticed two differences (laughs) so far. Did did you get your gift bag? (laughs) Yeah. Did you see that special present they gave us? Oh, yeah. That was impressive. That's so good. That that, that one was awesome. Anyway, um, so if I look at the Twitter website, on the in the settings area on the left hand side where it begins with accounts security and privacy blah 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 there's an there's another one which i believe is new that's notifications timeline and i don't recall having seen this before and it says filter tweets by and then there's a checkbox and only one of them that says quality filter it says quality filtering aims to remove all tweets from your notifications timeline that contain threats, offensive or abusive language, duplicate content or sent from suspicious accounts. I haven't yet turned that on just because I don't feel like I really need to. And what kind, what kind of people might need that feature? I'm having trouble thinking of any examples. Why? Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. Why is this not available to everybody? Yeah, because I, I, I got the two accounts open here. Well, it might not be available to everybody because like maybe there's a computational or like scalability thing or whatever. But then too bad. Fix that. 
We have computers now. Computers do these things quickly. (laughs) I'm trying to think of a a scenario where it's reasonable. But even if you're going to give it to a limited set of people, who would you give it to? Who might you give this thing that's limited? Say you only have, you know, 500,000 to hand out. Who would you give it to? I don't know. Maybe you would, like you said, divorce it from the verified and just offer it to people who are constant targets of abuse. Or no, maybe just not do that. (laughs) so yeah so there's that and then um it was actually mike who got verified uh in a in a beautiful wonderful turn of events got verified after we recorded analog so i had an entire (laughs) episode of analog to lord over him and and make fun of him for not being as cool as i am which was delightful but anyway he had noticed once he got verified that apparently in the official app there's a notifications tab and there's a new um, entry in the segmented control there. So he sent me a screenshot and what he had was all mentions. And I believe he said that the verified one was new. So he can look at notifications from everyone, notifications just in terms of mentions. Again, this is the official app or I guess mentions just from verified people or perhaps any sort of notification that's sourced with a verified individual. And those are the only two differences that I've noticed. I don't know, Marco, if you've noticed anything else. Well, not really just because I don't use the official client or the website very yeah, often. Same here. Um, so most of the stuff only is visible in those places. Um, and honestly, that might be like, you know, if if I started getting a lot of abuse again, uh, you know, there were there have been peers in the past where I've gotten here and there. I mean, nothing like what people like Brianna get. No, it's not even close. But you know, if that kind of thing became a problem for me, uh, I would very much consider switching to these official apps. And again, if you're going to make this like a content filter kind of thing and an abuse filter kind of thing, you want as many people as possible who are legitimate account holders to be verified. And if you charge a bit of money to be verified, it really does. You know, it, it, it puts a big barrier in front of and, you know, not necessarily like to the point where nobody can pay, but not a lot of people will pay in, in order to make a bunch of dummy accounts to troll people with or to harass people with. You know, typically, you know, when you pay for an account, you are less likely to be willing to just th- throw it away and, because you'll lose that money and you, you know, you'd have to pay again if you want to come back to the service. And, and like, like there have been like my, you know, my old friend, the something awful forums back from my early internet days, uh, they, they had a system there where you had to pay, I believe it was 10 bucks to register an account. And it was incredibly effective at keeping out spam and crap. And if anybody got banned, you know, if you, if you broke a rule, you'd get banned and like you're, you're just out 10 bucks. And if you want to come back, you got to pay another 10 bucks. And it really did make a big difference in how well that community was run and how little crap there really was there compared to the number of people that were there. Yeah, that system probably doesn't work for something that's supposed to be as, as mass market as Twitter, which is like, they, I think they'd have to come up with a hybrid strategy where they would have to be like, look, we, we will give out free check marks to everybody who we think deserves them. And then we will actually hire or set a policy where it deserves makes some sense to somebody in the entire universe. And then anybody can get it if they pay. Like you need to hire because you don't want it to be like, oh, because you, you know, so few people will pay. You don't want it to be like only people with this amount of disposable income are allowed to participate in Twitter because I think Twitter has already established itself as sort of like everybody can be on Twitter. It's open to everybody. It's free. Um Maybe that's not sustainable either, but it's kind of a shame to take a service with that broad of appeal, as opposed to something that's like a community like Metafilter or, or those forums you were talking about, where it's it's not going to be everybody. It's going to be a tiny subset, a very small community, and and even there, it's kind of a shame to select only people who can afford to add that money. But you're right that it is like incredibly effective uh, to raising the quality because no one wants to keep paying money to to make sock puppets because it just it gets expensive and it doesn't feel good. Um, I mean, I guess, the, unfortunately, at the scale Twitter operates, I can imagine people like running Kickstarters to fund the creation of their sock puppet accounts. Like in the alternate universe where Twitter was always a pay thing, <sighs> they would just raise tens of thousands of dollars from horrible people to constantly make it. I, and, you know, anyway, this is uh, like so many things Twitter does. This is in this weird state where it's not clear uh, what the new rules are. It's not clear how long this will last. As Marco said, who knows? They could get rid of check marks tomorrow and and split these features into two different things. Um, but at least it's some kind of motion on the front. And by the way, speaking of the check mark, I I use a third party client because I'm an old Twitter user. Um, I, I, I'm always surprised when people use the official client, but apparently lots of actual people do. Anyway, in my third party client, it has an option for whether it wants whether it should show the check mark overlaid on the little you know avatars for individual accounts. 
and I always have that turned off because I didn't like when I'm going through my timeline, I didn't like the sort of the visual indication that this person was more important and what they had to say was more important. I mean, if I dig into the account, if I ever have questions about, is this really the celebrity? I tap on their name and I can see the check mark. But seeing the check mark, mostly because I actually follow a lot of people who have check marks who I actually know, I don't need to constantly be reminded that they all have check marks. And I felt like it was making me pay less attention to the ones that don't have check marks. So I just turned it off on all of them, you know, pretty quickly after that uh, that feature was available several years ago. And I would definitely not want to turn it back on. Then you, then you, you aren't seeing our bling. <laughs> I know. Believe me, I know. I thought, honestly, Marco, I thought I thought you had had one for years. I'd forgotten about that whole little blow up thing. Yeah, and the funny thing is, right after I got mine, Marco and I were talking privately, and we had concluded, without a shadow of a doubt, collectively, that there was zero chance that you would solicit your own check mark because you are above that. And then fast forward like two hours, and you said in in the relay slack, <laughs> "Oh, I totally asked them, and I can't believe I haven't gotten." No, it. I I thought you knew this that we discussed it before. I wanted a check mark forever. Well, no, no, no. We knew that you wanted the check mark. That wasn't up for grabs. Yeah, but we also thought it, that there would be no chance that you would like apply. That I wouldn't apply. No, you have to. You have to apply once they say it's open to everybody. You have to apply. Like <laughs> I just choked down writing that stupid bio. I'm like, I got to do it. Like you should, like in the little box where they say like, tell us why we should verify you. I wrote like the most craven like disgusting here's why i'm an important person thing like i'm just i'm like this is the strongest argument i have <laughs> here it is i'm not <laughs> no no being coy no beating around the bush this is it uh, thank god that's not public <laughs> <laughs> but like i'm what am i gonna do be like all shy and demure and say like well probably you shouldn't give it to me i'm not that well known like no i think i should have it like i maybe i should have taken a couple sentences to say I mean, I can't even be honest and say, you should not be giving this to me before you give it to every single person who's ever been targeted by Gamergate. Like, it's, it, but if you, if you start yelling at them and telling them what they should do, also not a good way to get a check mark. So, anyway, they're just uh, not responding to my request anyway. So, it's been, what, three days now? Whatever. <laughs> so, on Analog, <laughs> uh, on the episode of Analog that will be out by the time this episode is out, uh, John, uh, John, you're John, Mike and I discussed uh, what we had written, and it was funny because we took two different approaches on, on what we wrote to justify our coolness, and I agree with you. It was it, I am not a fan of writing that sort of thing about, oh, look at me, I'm just so important, and let me tell you all the reasons why, uh, but... What I ended up doing was basically name dropping people that I knew and interact with that are also uh, um, verified. So, like, <laughs> that's not a power move, though. <laughs> My brother in law met Barack Obama once. Sort of. Right, well, exactly. No. I know Marco well, Armand. <laughs> well, that was the thing. So, no, no. I mean, I'm serious. That's what I, that was the approach I took was, you know, hey, I share a podcast with verified user Marco Armand. And John Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that he's verified that might have, that actually that actually strengthens it. To, uh, right, that's I, my point. No, 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 that was exactly my point. You know, and I, and I talked about how I'm also on Relay, <sighs> which also has Jason Snell verified and CGP Cray verified, and and my podcasts are heard, you know, by many thousands that's, of people each week. That's, and blah, that's blah, blah, a pretty blah, good blah. approach. I mean, obviously it worked, but then again, like uh, with this black box, we have no idea why it worked. <laughs> it could have been because what who the person who was decided to check your box listens to ADP. Boom, Casey List done. Yeah, and Mike took a different approach. Shoot, what did he say he did? I've forgotten now. But whatever it was, I spelled my name with a Y, which is much cooler than an I. <laughs> oh no, no, what it, that's what it was. Was he had said he he thought to himself, well, what? Why would they have ex- uh, uh, made this available to everyone? It must be because they they want people to verify their you know their identity and so mike was all oh you know i'm really concerned that people that listen to me might not be able to find the real me you know and in, in playing the whole like uh, parody card and and i'm very poorly paraphrasing what he said go listen go listen to that episode of analog but we took two different approaches and well i gotta tell you my bling looks great how does yours look marco <laughs> but he great. got his too like mike got and mike's yep. work too right <laughs> yep i mean mike totally deserves one too like i mean it's no question but like that that's an interesting approach i mean like i said i have had actual impersonators using my avatar and using variations on my name with different unicode glyphs and stuff to make a thing like that has happened to me not a lot but it has happened he ended up going with that approach and it working was it did they have real examples or was it just speculative as in like i'm afraid this could happen to me one day i don't recall i feel like it was speculative but i'm not 100 percent sure about that anyway you have no idea how annoyed I'm going to be when I get rejected. Because <laughs> then, then where do I go from there? Do I just reapply every six months forever? Three, uh, one month. Yeah, it's one month. 
every month. Uh, I can't. Uh, I did save that paragraph of text I wrote in that box just so I don't have to think it up again. So I'll just paste it in every month. But like, what a <laughs> what an existence that is. At a certain point, I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to be able to like to muster the. Uh, <laughs> it just. <sighs> what is the quote from Jerry Maguire? And why, why in the world am I asking you guys? Chat room. What is the Jerry, Magu- <laughs> Jerry Maguire quote? I forget to look it up now. Have you either one of you seen that movie? Yes, but forever ago. Yeah, I actually did see it, but I saw it like when it was new, which was a very long time ago. All I know is I, I love looking at my bling every time it flies by after I tweet. It looks good for a while. I, like I, I, I actually had trouble recognizing myself on Twitter. Like if I'd like double click a tweet to like get the the conversation history and like mine would be at the root because I wanted to see like which of my tweets this is in response to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I for like the first few days I it didn't register visually as me at that like when I see the avatar with the check mark on it because it's like that's not how I look on Twitter. <laughs> all right, here you go. This is the scene that you guys don't remember, but you should because <laughs> I cut all this. Full out. Of, it's, it's full of quotable things. Oh, you're not cutting my uh, Jerry Maguire quote out. This is, this is gold. <laughs> I gotta cut out like half this topic. It's so long. <laughs> Well, you, but we don't have much on the other end of it, so you, okay. you know we need filler here. <laughs> this is when Jerry's talking to uh, whoever Kubuding Junior was playing, like the athlete that he represents. He's a sports agent. It's the, I'm out here for you. You don't know what it's like to be me out here for you. It's an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about. Oh, I blew it! I was so close, so close. Anyway, up at dawn, pride swallowing siege is what I think of as a good description of uh, reapplying to get twitter verified every month because that is a hell of a pride swallowing siege oh wow oh john i i genuinely feel bad for you and uh i really want you to get verified you shouldn't no one should feel bad for me for the love of god no one please no one feel bad for you this is the most pathetic thing in the entire it's It's, not actually uh, important no you should not not feel bad for me you should you should pity me that i care about this at all well i do that too but don't cry for john argentina (laughs) <laughs> exactly. You know something from pop culture? Or are you quoting, like, the Madonna remake? No, I saw the... Uh, wait, which one came out, like, in the 90s? Madonna. That's the Madonna one. Okay, that's the one I saw. Yeah, it's fine. sorry. It's fine. Okay. At least I saw one of them. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, anyway... Um, <sighs> Well, I'll, I hope you get your check mark in no small part because it'll make getting the ATPFM check mark that much easier. Because we can say, "Hey, all three of well, us." Well, it, it probably won't because apparently the process is random, and if a teacher doesn't deserve one, neither is anyone targeted by Gamergate. <laughs> well, I mean, this is part of the problem with any of these like human review. It's it, you know, it's just like the App Store, where like even if you set rules in place, and even if the rules don't change, which I think for Twitter's verification process, those are two big requirements that probably have never been met before uh but assuming you have you know codified rules that don't change much over time you still have a team of humans enforcing them and like you know when when vitici's went through it could it was right after this big rush started it could have been a bunch of people who saw this giant pile behind them and it was right before lunch and they were tired and they were grumpy and they just started saying no 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 to it like it, it could be so many things once you'd have like humans trying to review a whole bunch of stuff subjectively and it's it's just these kind of rule systems will never be consistently enforced as long as there is that subjective component to it that's why this that's why they should remove that and it should just be like do you fit the basic qualifications you know can you prove your identity with like you know a government issued id that we trust and can you you know maybe pay a few bucks for our time since you since you know we're gonna do this for a lot of people that's it like that should be all it is and as soon as you put in judgment calls of, well, are you important enough? It's never going to be consistently enforced. We are also sponsored tonight by Hover. When you have a great idea for your blog or start up a store, you need to give it a great domain name. Find the perfect domain with Hover. It's ridiculously easy. Hover has over 400 domain extensions to end your domain with. Of course, they have all the classics like .com and .net. They have some of the new kind of kind of specialized ones like .design, .tech, some of the weird kind of jokey ones, .pizza, .ninja, .horse. They also recently launched .store. Now, among all these jokey weird ones that have been coming out over the last few years, .store is finally like a normal one that you can actually use for a useful purpose that doesn't sound jokey or weird or cheap or anything like that. Dot store is great. It just opened up. There's tons of great dot store domains available, all at Hover. Once you find your domain at Hover, you can use a feature called Hover Connect to set up your domain automatically with tons of popular website hosts and functions there. No more digging through crazy help articles trying to figure out how to get your domain working. It is really excellent at Hover. So find a domain, find a domain name for your idea. Go to Hover.com and use the promo code VERIFIED at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase. Once again, Hover.com, promo code VERIFIED. 
So, Marco, we're doing pretty well. We're about an hour in, and we still have one more topic left, and I think we might be able to dodge Stupid TiVo for one more week. So we got to stretch this one a lot. All right, we'll, we'll see what we can do. So tell me everything that I could ever possibly want to know about serial number tracking and forecast. Okay, now that you've ruined both product names of the things I was going to make. Um... <laughs> Wait, was that not... Wait, if he's looking at the show notes, you would know, know it was called that. But know, what was the other? What was the other name? Uh, the uh, side the track. alignment. Yeah, yeah you, he didn't say that. You did, didn't you? No, it, but it's in the show notes, and I missed it. So it's fine. It doesn't matter. Oh sh- <laughs> crap! I'm sorry. Don't worry Wait, about did, it. Have you not announced forecast? I've been. I kind of mentioned it here and there. It's also it's it's in the ID three tags of every MP three I've made in the last two months. So it's <laughs> it's it's just sitting right there. People have asked me on Twitter, like, "Hey, what's this forecast thing?" So yeah, oh, they, God, they I feel like out. such a turd. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Do, you, do we want to re-record that? We can re-record. <laughs> no, it's fine. no, no. Now you have to explain the, the goofy origins of the name in, in typical uh, Marco naming fashion. <laughs> I am excellent at naming things. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Actually, this is perfect because this will delay TiVo even more. So please tell me the name about this thing that I just spilled the beans on. Uh, sure. So Forecast is my podcast post-production uh, app for the Mac. It basically uh, is an MP3 encoder as well as a chapter and metadata editor. So it allows you to input a- any audio file, wave, AIF, you know, other MP3s, whatever else, and just edit the metadata on it. It encodes it to MP3 if it isn't an MP3 already. Uh, it uses my parallel uh, version of the lame MP3 encoder, like I discussed a few episodes back. Um, I, I did succeed in making that. It does work. The last few episodes of this show have been encoded with it, and nobody noticed, so that's good. And it also can do things like edit chapters. And you might have noticed in recent shows that not only have I been using chapters more uh, in the encode here, uh, but also that we've we've recently gotten um, here and there, I've, uh, I've been throwing in some chapter images uh, where you have a special a special image for showing up at certain times in certain shows uh, that's topically relevant. And this is all being done by this app, Forecast. Uh, and the reason I named it Forecast is because it's what comes before Overcast. Come on. I mean... It's... Oh, no, you got the three things. So it's the connection to the weather. So Overcast yes. and Forecast, you forecast the weather. You, but you've also... And then what was the one you just said? You've got the... Uh, you do it before it appears in Overcast. Uh-huh, yeah. And also... This application takes files and prepares them for Overcast. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. And Overcast ends in cast, which is because it's about podcasts. So it's all these different, you know, all these references in this name forecast. So, And also you are the famous creator of the podcast application Instacast, as far as I'm concerned, uh, right? Is that right? I, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, you know, people... For a while, I thought I kind of owned like the Insta prefix with Insta paper, mm-hmm. and then Instagram came out, and the game yeah, was over nope. because now, like everybody <laughs> just thinks anything Insta people people think Instagram. So even if I tried to, you know, and, and Instacast was a different podcast app by by a different person, e- but even if that never existed, even if I tried to launch a new podcast app called Instacast, people would think I was ripping off Instagram's name, not yep. not playing off my own <laughs> name of my own product from from you know 10 years ago <laughs> so anyway uh so my app is called forecast and it's a mac app although as far as i as far as i know there's nothing really about it that would make it that would preclude an ios version in the future if i really thought that, that it was warranted um but the there's not a whole lot of podcast production happening on ios these days so uh the, the demand is mostly on the uh, computer side and probably mostly on the mac side if i had to guess uh, between mac and pc so that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's uh, you know it's it's a small project. It's not like a massive thing. I've been working on it for a few weeks. It's at it's in beta now, a very small private beta, and I haven't really decided how to how and, and when to release it and charge for it. And I talked a little bit about this on Under the Radar uh, two weeks ago, so we'll link to that. Um, just basically considerations of like whether whether you should even charge money for something like this uh, or whether it's not even worth the hassle of charging money. Because like charging money brings a certain degree of overhead and, and of support burden and things like that. And, and if it's only going to make a small amount of money overall because of a you know, small volume of sales, it's kind of questionable like, you know, whether that's even worth doing. You know, like, you know, like the, the entire run of Bugshot uh, I, I I blogged you know when I when I was charging for it and when I still own Bugshot, um, the entire run of it made something like three thousand dollars, and three thousand dollars is a lot of money to a lot of people, and it was for me at the time as well. However, 
it it also took a pretty big portion of my summer to do that, and there was an opportunity cost there. Like I probably should have been working on Overcast uh, at the time, and instead I made Bugshot. And you know, to have only to have made a relatively small amount of money over like a year worth of sales, uh, it probably wasn't worth it in retrospect. And that's that's why I eventually just decided to just make it free and just you know learn from it whatever I could learn from having a free app in the store. So with with forecast, I'm, I'm kind of faced with a similar conclusion or a similar dilemma here uh, of do I charge for it or not? And I talked actually a little bit about this last week when we when we talked about sidetrack my alignment utility that also exists, although forecast is is way more in a releasable state because it's just a simpler problem. Uh, but anyway, I don't really know whether I'm going to charge for it or not. If I'm going to charge for it, it would probably be like fifty bucks because anything less than that. I don't think it would be worth it, but the problem is, like, how many people are going to pay for a podcast chapter utility? Now, there is a podcast chapter utility already in the Mac App Store today. I believe it's called Podcast Chapters. It's 20 bucks, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't look like it's selling in, in meaningful volume, which is too bad, uh, because I think this is a market that, that should be a strong market. With me going in there saying, I, I want to be able to charge 50 bucks for this, uh, it's not very promising that there's already one for 20 that appears not to be selling very well. So I think, you know, you got to figure like, yeah, you know, I could push it. I could, you know, use my brand and my blue check mark to really sell this thing. And like, <laughs> but how many copies am I really going to sell? How many people are really making chapterized podcasts and are willing to pay 50 bucks for my version of solving this problem? That number is probably something like 100 people at most in, in the most optimistic projection, 100 people, probably more like, 20 to 30 people if i'm really being honest like it's probably a very small number of of people who actually would buy this thing so because it's so small i i I'm, I'm leaning mostly towards not even charging money for it because it just seems like the overhead of charging money would not really be be worth setting all that up that being said you know i also have an app called quitter which we which we plugged poorly last episode <laughs> Um, I also have a Mac Apple Quitter, and it would kind of be an interesting learning experience to figure out how to charge money for Mac apps, to set up the infrastructure to charge money for Mac apps. This is all outside the, outside the App Store, um, because the, the Mac App Store does not really offer anything. It doesn't offer enough to make it worth the 30% anymore, uh, if it ever did. Uh, anyway, so big question is, do I release this thing, and then do I charge for it? And then if I charge for it, how do I charge for it? And then the uh, the follow up topic to this, which is uh, how do I do license management and piracy prevention, or rather piracy reduction? I guess I should say because <laughs> because I'm a realist here. I run. I know how these things work. So what do you what do you think? What should I do here? If you weren't going to charge for it, which you're, you're slowly convincing me, I, before I was like you should just charge a huge amount of money for it because five people are going to buy it. Um, and unfortunately, you're going to give free copies to those five people, so really you're going to sell zero, right? But as you talk about it more, I'm like, well, if it's going to be free, I start to think that, like, not only should it be free, it should be open source. Because when some annoying corner case of the spec comes out, there's enough nerdy people that they'll just, you know, send you a pull request. And, like, like why why not get the benefits of it being free? You're not going to get the, the, any of the benefits of, of making any money if you're going to make it free. Why not go all the way in the other direction and say, not only is this free, this is open source. Um, and then also, like, if you get tired of maintaining it, some other person who's more enthusiastic about maintaining it could take it over because you just want this tool to exist, which is why you're making it. Like, you're scratching your own itch here. Sure. It's not as if this is your grand plan for world domination, right? I think you would be fine if someone took it over and kept up with all these, you know, whenever you get a report like, oh, I tried to use your tool and it didn't work on this particular weird thing encoded with this. Like, you don't want to deal with that crap. Um, so I would say free and open source is a good option. Or close source and charge a huge amount of money as a deterrent <laughs> like, <laughs> to, to keep away the looky lose. Uh, yeah. And then see how it works out. And, and if you really do want to figure out like how, how can people send me money for a Mac application? Like maybe as people were saying in the, in the chat room, maybe make it like a tip jar type of thing where it's not even like patronage. It's not even like you're promising that anyone that you're even going to like put that money into further development this application it's just like look this is free if you like it and you want to say thank you put a dollar in this jar you get nothing for this dollar like it it doesn't even guarantee that i'm ever going to make another version of this application but if you just want to be a nice person do that and i think that 
they can make as much money as the one where you charge uh, five people 50 bucks. It might. Well, okay, so let me, let me address these two separately because these are two, two big topics, I think. So first, op- the open source question. That is a very, very good question. It's, and it's an interesting theory of, you know, should this just be open source? And I've thought about that for this and sidetrack. What I found, though, you know, in just being a person using computers for a while and, and a little bit, you know, a little bit of direct developer experience, but mostly just being a user of this stuff, what I found is that there, there tends to be not that much value to entirely open sourced applications, especially for fairly narrow uses like this. There is lots of value in open source components and utility libraries and stuff like that. There's lots of value there. But the value of open sourcing the entire app here is is not incredibly great unless there's going to be a lot of contributors working on it. And for most apps, that simply doesn't happen. Uh, from you know, most apps getting a lot of contributors is like is like this this fantasy that you have when you think about open sourcing it, but then if you actually do open source it, almost nobody contributes and you get a handful of pull requests here and there and then then it just work then it's just like then it's like going through resumes but people put all this work into it and then you have to like you know you have to, the ones you want to accept you got to like you know make sure they work you got to test them with all of Casey's unit tests and all this crazy stuff and then <laughs> and and even the ones that 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 work that you want to add it might not really have been in the way that you would would have wanted to do it or the code might be messy so you, you got to let go when it's open source True. you got to like let go of the thing and like and I think you don't want a whole bunch of a contributor or something I think you just want like two smart people contributing to it and that's it and that all it does is like re- relieve the the maintenance burden for you with the idea that eventually you'll be bored with it and and someone else will just take it over and then you'll be sending them five line pull requests. Yeah, but I mean, I think in reality, again, that that's a great theory. In reality, that doesn't happen very often. And also, when you so when you open source things, you know, especially a full app like this, like you have the problem of like you're generating work for yourself because you're going to have to deal with the the contributions and and the reports from people and and every and the but pull you requests don't, you don't have to deal with the contributions you just you can just ignore it eventually people will fork it and like like that's that's the only yeah but then you're a jerk no it's not yeah. I, like, I feel like that's every that. open source thing i've ever done it's been like look here it is maybe if i feel like it i'll look at your pull request but if not like because if people are annoyed that you're not taking the pull request they'll just fork it and then like they've taken over that's the only way you get people to take it over is you just neglect it and then someone else takes it over and you're like <laughs> oh good done um like I, I, I'm thinking of it as totally, like not feeling any social responsibility because this is a very obscure thing. Yes, like it is not a mass market thing. It's super obscure, and it's just it's just kind of your way of having like it's like buying a lottery ticket for removing a small amount of maintenance from your future. But it really is totally giving up ownership of it. So forget about like picking a cool name for it and having any ownership or any stake in it or whatever. It's just like completely open source. Like it's, it's the far extreme of the, of these possibilities, which you haven't right. ever done anything like this. And, uh, and the only reason I'm suggesting it in this case is because this seems like the only time I would ever recommend it because it's, it's so, it's so clearly not, not a thing that has any potential upside that like, that is significant. Yeah, I agree with John. Unless you're going to sp- uh, be charging an absurd amount of money, which I think in principle you could because the kind of people that would use this are probably the kind of people that make a decent amount of money at, uh, making these shows. Mm, that's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true, but it's certainly possible. But but regardless of that, I, I think John has convinced me listening to him that open sourcing it is probably the best way to go because the key to open sourcing it is is that you can point at that you know, GitHub repo and just say, yep, shrug. It's up to you, man. I did my part. Now it's up to you. And, and then if somebody complains to you that something isn't working, you can, you are completely absolved of any guilt because it is within their power in principle to fix it. And, <laughs> that, that's a wonderful theory. That doesn't work in practice that no, but way. Like it does. Like it, you could, it's, just, it's just a change in attitude. You just say, like, like the, I, I'm not offering you support for this. This is not a product. You didn't pay me any more. Like, if, any, if anyone actually complained, be like, you're getting what you paid for. I'll refund all zero dollars of your money. Like, don't even respond to the emails. Don't even look at the things. Like, oh, I'm good at that. Tons of, tons <laughs> of open source stuff are, is like that. And I just don't think anyone can get mad about it. It's like, plop, here it is. And you can continue to edit your thing or like, like there is no obligation. I feel, and this is, you know, this is a topic of some controversy in the open source world. People are like, once you have it open source, you have to like maintain it and deal with pull rest. No, you don't. That, I'm totally of the opinion. <laughs> if you just want to plop a bunch of code down and be like, oh, look, here it is and never, 
never communicate with anyone in the entire world about it ever again. Just put it under a license. It's like, you want it? Here you go. Fork it. Do whatever the hell you want. You and your friends, do whatever you want. If you don't have the ability to change it, oh, well, you sucks to be you. Like, but whatever. I'm, I'm a programmer. I wrote this for my own purposes. And as a nice aside, I'm going to chuck it out there so other people can mess with it if they want. If I'm in the mood and someone sends me pull requests, maybe I'll incorporate it, but no promises. Maybe I'll never look at it again, which... I understand, like, that doesn't feel good to a lot of people. It doesn't, but, like, to me, that feels like one of the beautiful things about open source. Like, that, that you, that it's kind of like, rather than sort of keeping it to yourself, like, say you, we take the, the selling it to other people off the table, which I don't think it should be off the table. But anyway, say, say the alternative was like, I wrote this out for myself and I use it myself. And this is the alternative, of like, don't, don't hide it. It's, it's like, uh, taking all your belongings with you when you die right like you, you know as soon as i died burn every one of the the uh, van gogh paintings i own because i don't want anyone else to ever have them it's like i made this thing for myself but also i want to share it with the world so if you want it here it is it is what it is uh go nuts with it and them having it doesn't affect you because it's software like you can both have it at the same time um and <laughs> you can both do whatever you want with it uh develop it not develop it whatever um and the final thing is, like, it has all the benefits of being free, because, like, if we look at the iTunes podcast directory, there are a huge number of podcasts. If you made a free tool like this, word would get around among the tons and tons of sort of, like, uh, you know, like the, whatever the bell curve looks like for podcasts in terms of traffic numbers, the long tail of podcasts that, that are out there. There's, there are a lot of podcasts, and I bet uh, a few of them, if they needed a tool that did this, and the word got out, like, oh, if you need a tool that does this, the easiest one is this free Mac app click on this thing download the thing and use it whatever you're help like you're helping a lot of people do their podcast production and if those people come looking for like oh i found a bug in this program or whatever you don't have to respond to them either because they got a free application off like a github page like maybe they won't even be downloading it from your page they'd be downloading it from the seventh or eighth person who forked it who knows well okay and those are all reasonable concerns and reasonable points but I don't think I'm ready to give up that kind of control. I know, I know. I, 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 I totally know from your personality you don't want to do this. But well, I'm just Right. <laughs> and by open sourcing it, you, you close a lot of doors for yourself in the future. Like, I mean, yes, you open some. Thank you, Richard Stallman. But, you know, you, you close a lot of doors for yourself of, like, what if I wanted to start charging for it in, in, a, in like, the next version or, or even, even just take this version and start charging for it? Like, it, there, there are a lot of opportunities that you basically close off by, by doing that. Also... Open source has has a number of problems in in today's world, and I don't know if this was always the case, but it certainly seems like today this is this is a big problem. Where any kind of open source app now in the world of app stores will have lots of opportunistic uh, vultures and scammers, basically just taking it, changing the name, maybe if you're lucky, and putting it on the app store for money and trying to make money off of it. it this happens so, to all sorts of open source applications now. It happens a lot. App review would never allow that. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. just put, a, put a little icon of Mario on it and exactly, uh, exactly. And call it Minecraft 2.0, and I'm sure that will go right through app review. Exactly, and and so it basically, like, it, it, there, there's a lot of problems with like entire open source applications. That's one of them, uh, and so yeah, I mean. I don't think I'll open source it. You know, if I if I ever decided that I was like done working on it and that I would, that it was going to be unmaintained, you know, maybe then I would open source it. That, that that would be kind of the classy move to do if there were no obvious problems by doing that. Uh, but you know, that's it, I I think I'd keep it closed source until I figure out what to do with it. Um, that being said, you know, again, like, do I really charge for it or not? I don't know. I mean, ultimately, the world is better off if it's free. But I have a hard time justifying working on it if it's free. So I have to kind of balance that, like, you know, is it really, like, because every day I spend working on this, I'm not improving Overcast. And I still need to do that, too. And, you know, I, I need to, like, this This needs to be a project that I only work on in short bursts so that I can get back to working on Overcast, which is still providing the bulk of my software income. So, you know, it's, I, I don't know, it's it's a tough balance, I would love to be in a position where I could start making real money from podcasting tools and have that start being an important enough part of my business that I could spend more time working on it. 
But I think as as many people have, have found when they try to get into this business, it's just very hard to make money off of podcasting tools because even though podcasting is, is really doing very well right now, the number of podcast producers is still fairly small relative to things like blogging and stuff, and stuff like that. It, it's still a pretty small number producing podcasts and of the ones who produce podcasts there are so many different ways to produce them so many different tools people prefer to use or can afford to use or need to use in various conditions that they're working in that even if you make a tool the the percentage of the market that will actually choose to use that tool especially if it's if it's charged charge money for it like it, you're talking about very small numbers of people and if you if you raise the price high enough to make it worth your time to develop it, those people wouldn't be able to afford it anymore. So it, it's it's just really it's a very hard market to really make money in uh, directly through direct sales. Now, of course, there are other strategies I could use here. I could give away a whole bunch of great production tools for free that are all optimized for how Overcast works, and so this would put me in a position to do things like you know add new metadata formats that it, that that Overcast could debut, being the first app to read them. And that would also piss off a lot of people, but you know that's that's an option I could do. Uh, I could just have this thing be a be something that you know pushes the MP3 chapter format because I love MP3 chapters. I hate M4A chapters. That's a terrible format. Um, and this would help push it towards MP3, which Overcast deals better with, which everybody deals better with. It's a much easier format. Uh, it's it's actually documented. That's a big one right there. Uh, thanks Apple for not never documenting the original uh, M4A uh, AAC enhanced format. Uh, anyway, there's lots of options I have here. I don't know how interesting this is for all the listeners. So I guess I guess I can move on from that portion of you know whether I release it, whether I charge for it, uh, and then we can move on to discussing piracy. Fun, but first. <laughs> We are sponsored this week by Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash ATP to get $5 off your first purchase. And you know how razor companies keep putting out new models and raising their already high prices? Well, our friends over at Harry's don't believe in upcharging. They just made a bunch of improvements to their razors and blades, and they're keeping prices exactly the same. So it's still just $2 per blade cartridge compared to the 4 or more dollars you will pay at the drugstore for the big brands. Harry's five-blade razor cartridges now include a softer flex hinge for a more comfortable glide, a trimmer blade for hard to reach places a lubricating strip and a textured handle for more control when it's wet harry's was founded by two friends to offer people a great shave at a fair price this is for both men and women by owning the factory in germany where they make their blades harry's can produce high quality razors themselves and sell them online for half the price of drugstore brands really half the price two bucks per blade cartridge for harry's blades or less if you buy them in bulk Quality is 100% guaranteed, always. If you don't love your shave, Harry's will fully refund your money. So get the starter set today. The starter set is an amazing deal. You get a weighted razor handle of your choice, moisturizing shave cream, three precision-engineered five-blade cartridges, and a travel cover, all for just 15 bucks. And for limited time only, there's a special offer for fans of the show where you can get it for even less because you go to harrys.com slash ATP and you get $5 off your first purchase. That's just 10 bucks for the starter set. It's an amazing deal. Go to harrys.com slash ATP right now to claim your offer. That's harrys.com slash ATP. Thanks a lot. So based on your what we know about you and how you don't want to do this open source and you don't want to give it away for free or whatever, but also what you said about the maximum addressable market for this application being relatively small, it's making me lean pretty heavily towards the idea that you'd not spend much time trying to prevent piracy because i've been discussing in slack over the past weeks and has, has been discussed many times on the web especially in the old days back before uh you know in the days of shareware and everything you can uh, invest essentially infinite time in trying to stop piracy you will always lose it's almost impossible to stop um unless you're really bad to your legitimate users and 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 for what to to get like two extra users out of an addressable market of 100 it's just not worth it like so not only should you not spend lots of your time on an application that you know is not going to make tons of money, uh, but of the time that you spend, all that time should be on the actual application. Very little of it should be on the part that you know prevents piracy. Just, you want to prevent super casual piracy, so do basically the simplest thing that will possibly work, and uh, and I would say that's it. And then just like you know, you don't want to do nothing because it's so easy to just do something, and that helps. Um, but and especially if like. As you mentioned, the ambition to be like, this could be a stepping stone to like, a, a, you know, 
a, a suite of podcasting tools or an integrated integrated podcast production application like you have to build your way up to an app like that it's very difficult for a single developer yeah with other applications to do that like but if you are going to build your way up to it you'd want to build it on a ladder of small applications that make money and that you learn things from and that once you do like marco's minimal casual piracy prevention kit you just reuse that in all the other apps you do and then you know there's there's a it's an infrastructure win like you do it once do it to your satisfaction don't worry about it again uh and then try not to because as programmers it's fun to get sucked into like oh i can battle these hackers and what if i do this clever thing and that and like (laughs) you're gonna lose and it's just a rat hole and no one gives you money for thwarting hackers like literally no one gives you money like it's the old thing of like how many of those people would have paid uh if you had prevented it like do enough to keep the, the people with a conscience vaguely honest and then call it a day yeah that's i mean that's basically my thought here too which is if i charge for this which again i'm i'm really leaning mostly towards keeping it closed source but probably releasing it for free but if i do charge for it ultimately i agree because you know I grew up as as a PC user in, in the late 90s, pirating tons of crap as, as a stupid teenager. I know how these things work. And I it's been a while since I've been in that scene, but I'm pretty sure it basically works the same way now as it always has. The easiest case scenario is you share a key. And even if you start doing like key checks, well, then you just hack the binary to bypass the check. And no matter how obscure, and you know, you can obfuscate the check, you can put multiple checks all over the code. There's all sorts of strategies and techniques you can do. And ultimately, none of them really work for very long. Um, and you can look at the gaming market, the PC gaming market, for all their wonderful tricks they, they've tried to do over the years, and most of which get cracked fairly quickly. You know, granted, a big reason those get cracked is because there's a lot of people who want them to be cracked. And if for a very narrow tool like this, if there's only going to be like a hundred possible customers, like, you know, it's very likely that none of those hundred people are actually like professional crackers. <laughs> but you know, the, the reality is that I, I agree that it's not really worth spending a lot of time on. It is worth spending some time on because a little goes a long way. If if you put in a system where like, all right, I just bought it and I want to give it to Casey, and I just you know, do I email him a copy of my key and he just enters it and it works? And then what if he wants to give it to a friend? Does he just pass along my key too? Like, you know, how, how does all these things work? Or in the case where none of us have bought it, you know, does he go on whatever the BitTorrent tracker of the month is and try to download it from there or download a crack from some, you know, big database or something? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've tried to pirate anything, but, uh, or at least anything that wasn't a TV show. But uh, I, I assume that's how these things still work. And you're never going to win against that. And so, yeah, it isn't worth a lot of effort uh it, and there's and I, I am i am of course not naive enough to assume that uh every pirated copy is a lost sale and that if i make it impossible to pirate on on the crazy assumption that i can uh that i will somehow get all those sales again like i, I know that's not how the world works uh but i would build something you know i could do some kind of cryptographic key like that's pretty easy i have like a public private key thing already set up to like you know i can verify that my server generated a certain string like and you know with a signature and everything but this all really seems like it's probably not necessary at all because it's probably not worth charging for at least for a while and maybe someday if i have you know a few years down the road if i have like a suite of tools that i can release together as like one suite and maybe charge 50 or 100 bucks for that maybe that becomes more compelling and maybe I've charged then, but I just don't see charging for this now uh, in, in a way that would be really worth the trouble because I, I think at most I might make a couple thousand dollars over the course of like a year. And it, you know, I know that sounds like a lot of money to some people, but if I have to have this entire support system in place to make that, it's probably not worth it. Yeah, you know, As I'm thinking about it and listening to you talk, the only reason I can see not to to open source it on the assumption that it's free, which is what it sounds like you're kind of backing your way into, the only reason I can see not to open source it is if you wanted to eventually sell it down the road. And that's a weak argument to begin with. But if you make it free, there's still a support burden. It may not be quite as obnoxious as a paid app, but you still have a support burden. Whereas if you open source it, it should absolve you of any support burden. 
I guarantee you it doesn't. I guarantee it. Well, but that's all in you, right? I think I think the free the free one absolves you of support too, because if it's free, like I don't think the open source gets rid of the support. Like the, what the open source does is, the, I was just saying, like if people do send you patches, you don't have to accept those. But if you give a free app too, that there's no support burden there. It's like it's a it's a free app. Like this is what I'm using right now. I happen to put a link up on my website. You feel free to download it and use it, but. You get nothing from me. I don't owe you anything. I, again, I will refund your entire zero dollars that you paid for it. Well, but when if it's open source, then you can say, "Well, go fix it yourself," which is obnoxious. But no, you can't actually. You can't actually say that. You should never actually say that, and you can't say that because nobody who complains knows how to fix it. Yeah, I mean, like, I am a programmer. I use lots of open source libraries and stuff and things, and I hardly ever fix bugs in them. I just, if I find a problem with one, I either work around it or I stop using it. Usually. Because usually it's a it's a deeper problem that I don't feel qualified to fix or don't want to spend the time to get familiar enough with the code base to fix correctly. I mean, like like ha- how many podcast producers are also Mac programmers? Some of them are, but probably not a lot of them. And yeah, that's a fair point. I I really feel like if you have a free app, you will definitely a free closed source app. You will definitely get support requests and complaints and if it were me anyway i would feel a lot more compulsion to to address those because i'm the only person on the planet who can address them as opposed to if this thing was on github which admittedly the people who are emailing may not have the capability of of fixing the problem but but at least there's some other human being out there that might be able to and that's how i would rest easy at night is knowing look I'm not helping all these people that are whining about what does and doesn't does or does not work, but I'm also not standing in the way of them figuring out a, a way to fix it. If he has any future designs on on podcast production products, which clearly he has, though, all you'd be doing is giving a head start to your competitor, to your future competitors, essentially. Like someone could just pick up that code and say, "I'm going to use this as the basis of my competing suite," and that's that's not a good plan if that's here. If if you even not you even plan to do that, but like. I might do that, like like Marco said. Wants, I want to leave that option open. Uh, so yeah, and getting back to the serial number thing, I think the most important feature of the anti piracy thing, other than the fact that it, it exists at all as a you know a non zero barrier, is that it not annoy honest people, and that yes. is the pump, pop, the part where most of these systems fall down. Because really, we're like, it's again, it's so tempting to be to judge your anti piracy system on how well it prevents piracy, but your anti piracy system should be judged on how little it annoys uh, people who are not pirates, and that's really hard to do. Uh, and you really, mostly in terms of restraint, you have to like back off and not be like, but 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 if I can't contact the server to verify the code, I shouldn't launch, right? It's like no, no, you gotta you gotta just let go. <laughs> just think think about the honest user and how you never want to be in their face. Yeah, no, I mean that's. I mean, I, I've because I am me. I have brainstormed all sorts of crazy ways that I could do this. That like, thing, of course, I'm I'm thinking about doing a passwordless email lock-in because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> we we already beta tested that. The focus group is not a uh, not good. I still don't have a problem with it. Yeah, that's because maybe your emails actually show up in time, and you're not sitting there hitting refresh on your email client, going <sighs> cursing Marco every time. Yeah. So anyway, uh, those of us with really email clients love these kind of systems. <laughs> but anyway, it's not the client; it's your damn server. It's stuck in a queue somewhere, trying to get out of your ISP. It's not my server; it's your client. This is why you don't use the Gmail web app, kids. This is why you don't use Gmail, kids. Uh, Gmail's fine. Oh, Gmail gets mail. Gmail gets mails like instantly, except for it, yours. Some, apparently, some no, no. Some <laughs> websites, third-party websites that are not Google's. I go and I do like reset my password. I click the reset my password link and like. Before the mouse button is up, it arrives in the other browser window in Gmail. Like, and when I see that, I realize it's not Gmail that's not checking my mail fast enough. It's something else. Whether it's internet traffic, email is a store and forward system, many things can go wrong. It's not that. It's gray listing. <sighs> it's always gray. If there's ever a delay in email arriving in 2016, it's gray listing. It is not like, oh, the, the postfix queue is full. No, like, that's... We are so far past that point these days. So for those of you who aren't familiar, gray listing is a type of spam prevention technique where basically the the theory is that spam servers have to go through this massive list 
and don't have time to like retry and wait around if the server says I'm busy, try again later. So the idea is, but 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 a well behaving mail sending server, if the if the destination server says sorry, I'm busy, try again later, it'll actually hold onto that message for a while, like a week, and and it'll just try like every hour or every you know whatever. It'll try again after certain uh, certain short intervals, and then followed by long intervals. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So a spam prevention technique that a lot of people that a lot of places do is upon like the first time you you get email from from a certain sender so you don't already know that they're legit you you just tell them oh you know what I'm busy right now wait a bit and the theory is that the spammers will just move on because they're the spam bots don't have enough memory to keep track of all those things and try again later uh, and then but but legit servers will try again later and it'll get through and that's why so often the first email you get from a certain service or whatever else will be delayed by like an hour be, that's that's what's happening it is not any other reason it is that it is great listing but it's not the first email from your servers that gets delayed it's random and it's not an hour it's like 60 seconds but it seems like a long 60 seconds when i'm sitting there waiting for it to arrive well no it's it's kind of it's up to usually well okay i see what you're saying it, where in your in your case it's not that long but yeah because like it's i think it's kind of up to the client as to like up to the sender as to when they try again but i think i think a common practice is about an hour or something like that but yeah anyway it's kind of like the the uh orders of magnitude in terms of like instantaneous is, is less than the speed and like uh you know not waiting is less than you know 100 milliseconds and like there's, there's certain like you know orders of magnitude of like 10 milliseconds 100 milliseconds one second of like you know when does attention wander when do you feel like you can go off and do other things when do you feel like you're waiting on it and going from one having a password and having it autofill and clicking the button is in a different order of magnitude than having to go to get an email like even before you get into the idea of like having to find a link to click on or whatever or copy and paste something or whatever it is you may have to do it is just a whole other order of magnitude in terms of responsiveness of like how long does it take me to log into this site um, and what other things does it involve so not a fan all right thank you to our three sponsors this week hover trunk club and harry's and we will see you next week now the show is over They didn't even mean to begin Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental John didn't do any research Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter E-Y-L-I-S-S, so that's Casey Liss, M-A-R-C-O-A-R-M-E-N-T, Marco Arman, S-I-R-A-C, USA Syracuse, it's accidental. see all the articles uh like like oh passwords the end of the password passwords are over like they're all the just i i don't know why i even click on those articles anymore because all they're talking about is like oh password this login this it's like this you know hellscape where reset my password is the only way you can log into anything essentially well but i mean honestly first of all that is not that bad i've done it it's fine second of all that is kind of the reality of how a lot of people log into things anyway because a lot of people <laughs> I, I know but it's not a, it's not a good reality like it's a bad reality i don't want that reality agreed but a lot of people like just always forget their password to everything and they just click that link almost every time they log in i know but anyway you still need to password to your email like you, you eventually get down to a one password situation and then hey why not just use one password so here's a question <sighs> what if what if my key system was a web login and what if it was basically like in the app it would have like email and password no no <laughs> you, can can you not make a, a client-side application that does not have a server component you do not need a server component for he's just like i want to write php damn it i know it's a mac app but like there's such a huge huge win to just giving people a binary and then they never touch your servers like it, gets, it scales much better than you having to babysit servers well but that but that does not do anything about key sharing which is probably the biggest form of casual piracy no no but i'm saying like if it's free like if it's free application i just want to see oh, you ship yeah. a free a free uh, like quitter quitter i guess you did it there's no server component to quitter right yeah it's just free but but you're just dying to, to do something in php like i could have a login page <laughs> i like php <laughs> i love all the backslashes in the namespaces
No, I'm just kidding. I still haven't used a single namespace because I hate the backslash. Uh, right. You quickly got over Windows then, huh? Yeah. I, so, oh, I, I could talk about that briefly if you want. If, if we don't have an after show, it doesn't have to do with TiVo. Um, so, yeah, basically, I, I, I asked on Twitter, so Tiff wants to play um, a certain game that's only available on uh, Xbox One. Yeah, Xbox One and Windows. You asked on Twitter. That's how you're going to start the story? <laughs> so what, what's the real start of the story the real story is i was asked because i'm a person who you know who plays games on max hey i want to play inside how should i do it and i told you the answer two days pass and then you post on twitter hey can anyone tell me how i can play inside as if we had never talked as if the discussion never took place <laughs> as if what i had to say was just garbage and obviously not trustworthy because what do i know having actually played inside on a mac what did you t- you, t- you t- had this conversation with me or tiff Oh, one of you two. You're the same person. You live in the same house. No, it's not. Oh, no, no, they are wait not. a minute. Oh, no, we are two different people. Not. She was like, "Can you convince Marco to do this?" I'm like, "You can convince Marco. He's your <laughs> husband. I bet you. I bet you have some influence in that area." So, so wait. So before I tell you what I did, what should I have done? So my my options were basically like, should I should I attempt to go through the hassle of making a boot camp partition, and and of course you know then having to install have, first having to get Windows, having to install Windows, and then having to run Windows. Or should we just buy an Xbox One? Because uh, they're actually not that expensive these days. The answer, the, the surrounding context of this is that a bunch of people who are on the Incomparable have played inside. And it's the whole reason I uh, wanted to play it was like, they've already played it and uh, they wanted to have a podcast about it. And if you want to be on the podcast, you have to have played it. And at this point, there was no implied schedule of like when we were going to do this thing. But the point is they had just played it, like three or four people had played it. So there was a possibility that, hey, three or four people played it. It could have gone up on the schedule for like next week's show. And so time was kind of of the essence here. Um, And in that scenario, in the context of which it was asked, hey, a bunch of people played inside. I want to play it, too. I only have a Mac. The answer, the obvious answer is boot camp, because it's not just an investment for this game, because you can play lots of things in boot camp. There are lots of games that are only available for Windows. And it's really easy to do. And I know you have tons of spare hard drives laying around, and it gets you the game the fastest with the most bang for your buck. Now, the Windows thing is an issue but had you followed up with me on that i would have told you the same thing everyone on twitter did but you can get a free trial and does the free trial matter for a game that takes three hours to play who cares a 90 day 30 day free trial of windows like this is the fastest way to go from zero to i have played inside uh with <laughs> minimal especially if you're not the one who has to install boot camp just make make you do it and like tiff just makes you do it and it's fine uh but even if you have to do it yourself like i did before you even got to the point where you asked the same question on Twitter to get the same answers from other people, I had finished the game already. <laughs> I had installed, I had installed boot camp, played the game, finished it. Like it is not that bad. Um, and now I actually have, I actually have a, had a legitimate copy of Windows Seven from back in the day. So now I have a more up to date boot camp partition. And by the way, yes, my two thousand eight Mac Pro played inside just fine at native res. Oh, of course. So Casey, what do you think I should have done? Oh, you absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, buy the Expo. <laughs> because that is the most Marco solution to this problem. But no, but you don't know, like, the the, the backstory in the Xbox One is there's two new ones coming out. The, a better version of the current one and then a much more powerful one a year later. So this is kind of the wrong time to buy an Xbox One as well. How much is the Xbox One? You can get them on. You can get them on Amazon for about two hundred and fifty bucks. You absolutely buy the Xbox One, and then if you want to try to sell it for a hundred bucks later, you're not going to be able to sell that Xbox One once the new ones come out. <laughs> so, so here is my dilemma. Basically, like the Xbox is the lower effort ver the the lower effort, slightly more money version than just buying Windows or whatever else, which is the Marco version. That is the Marco version. Yeah, probably right. However, and and if it was if it was a PS4 and I didn't already have a PS4, I might have done that. However, our house is full of game consoles that we've played very briefly and then they just sit around for the next 7 years collecting dust under the TV. And I I just I don't want another console because like if you look at these two options, what do I have like after we're done with this? If it, whether it's like a Windows partition or an external Windows drive or whatever or this game system what am I stuck with afterwards in the house? Like, what is going to collect dust in the house afterwards? If it's a boot camp partition, nothing. Or at worst, an external disk of some kind. If it's the game system, which admittedly is easier, I have this giant box sitting around and these controllers and these plugs and these adapters and all this crap. I, like, I, I have game systems. We have a PS3 in the closet that I hardly ever played. Uh, we have a PS4 that we've played, that Tiff played, like, I think, two games on so far. 
uh, and and you know, VR stuff is going to come out and make all these systems irrelevant anyway. Well, let's not go crazy here. We, we have a 360 that, that that I bought like you know back in like 2008 or something. That's that has very rarely actually you know we've used it in bursts here or there like to like tiff would play a certain game on it or i play a certain game on it but for the most part it didn't get a lot of use before that we had a Wii that didn't get a lot of use because like everyone else's we we tried it had fun for a month and then never played it again you know we, somewhere we have a we fit balance board where the same the same fate happened i mean so like i have all these like giant plastic game systems all over the place trying to figure out what the hell to do with them you can't really sell them they're not really worth enough to justify like their shipping weight once they're used and old and so, like, I was like, what What the heck do I do with all this? So, and also, the Xbox One, in the current generation, just seems like the loser system. And, and I apologize for anybody who has one, but it just seemed like I have so often in my life made the wrong choice on a format war or a game console generation or something. I've so often, like, chosen the losing side and then been stuck with this, like, losing hardware and, and you know, having all the problems that go along with that. And so I try to avoid that as much as I can these days because I've I've done that so many times. Like I bought a DVD plus R drive. I mean, come on. So I try to avoid that. And the Xbox One just seems like it has so definitively lost this generation. And you know, some generations are closer than others. This one seems like it's not close. Well, the Xbox One. That's that's the other reason you don't want to buy it now because it's it is poised to win the 0.5 generation that they're both doing. Like so, when in, in the revised versions, the not the sh- not the Xbox that is essentially the same Xbox One but smaller and like quieter. Like right, it's coming out like in a week. Yeah, whatever. Not that one. Like that's fine. That's just like what they normally do. But the one after that which will be competing with the new, new PS4, they will both be more powerful consoles. The new, more powerful Xbox One will be much more powerful than the new, more powerful PlayStation 4. So it'll be an inversion of the current scenario where the PlayStation 4 is slightly more powerful. This will this will widen the gap in the opposite direction. It, will that be enough to make the Xbox One do better in this generation? Probably not, especially since they'll have to make the games play on the Xbox One too. But... Uh, it's all it means is that this is the wrong time to buy an Xbox One, essentially, unless there's a whole bunch of games that you know you want to play. But more importantly, in this whole big thing that you've in this that you've gone through, the most salient fact here is while you've been worrying about this, Tiff has not been playing Inside, and she could be done already. <laughs> it's a three-hour game; you could have been done. Like all this hemming and hawing is like pointless. And to, like, oh, well, you're not stuck with much in Steam. Not only you're not stuck with much if you make like a bootcamp partition, that is an asset. She will not delete it. There are tons of games on Steam that are only available on Windows when they have steam sales she'll buy something for three bucks and get a day's worth of fun out of it and that's a good deal like you won't be like and i know you have hard drives hanging around. you don't have to buy a hard drive like you have them there this you should have already done this i feel like you're failing as a husband and probably as a father <laughs> adam is disappointed in you too let's be honest so here's the other the other side of this the rationale on the boot camp side is i find windows dirty like i don't like windows i i was there for so long i i, I fled and i don't want to go back and i have I have occasionally maintained a bootcamp partition on my own computer on my on my own Mac, um, very occasionally, and the last time was a very long time ago. Because every time I do it, I regret having done it because I just I realize how much I hate Windows and how much I actually don't like gaming very much anymore. Anyway, but Tiff Tiff does play games, so you know, so I wanted to do, I want to do something for her. So I but her computer has like no free space because she has tons of photos on it because she's a photographer. So tons of photos on there. There's no free space in the built-in drive. I I eventually learned that oh, you can actually do boot camp on external drives these days. I didn't realize that until fairly recently. That solves a lot of these problems because then like I don't feel like I have this like dirty Windows partition sitting around like junking up my mac all the time because i can just unplug the drive and put it in a drawer and then it's it's gone you know so uh i didn't but i also didn't want to put it on a spinning disc because those are huge and ugly and loud and i actually don't have any two and a half inch spinning discs i I only have three and a half inch ones that i I could devote to it and that would be even larger and even louder and, and even hotter and slow and I don't think I even have any three and a half inch enclosures. This is a lot of excuses. I installed it on a big spinning three by five inch disc, and you know what? I already played the game. Good. <laughs> and I hate Windows more. I guarantee I hate Windows more than you. Guarantee. It. <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyway. So instead of doing any of those options, I had to buy something, of course, because I like buying things. Uh, I went on Amazon and I bought one of those little Samsung T three uh, external SSDs. Oh, of course you did. Yeah, because they're great overall mm-hmm. like they're fantastic yeah, so, little ssds yeah, so and i didn't have any other ssds that were large enough i had like an old really tiny one but none that were large enough so i just bought the 250 gig one for like 80 bucks on amazon a few a few days ago it arrived yesterday 
I installed it all this morning. I, I followed the Stack Overflow instructions on like how to do an external Windows. First, you have to like load up VMware, load up load up Windows in that. Use the disk image tool and whatever you know automated install tools or whatever to do all this stuff to make it configurable on the external drive. Then install Windows in the external drive using these other Windows installation from your VMware. It's like all this crap. I'm like, all right, I'll put all this crap in my laptop to configure all this because I don't, I don't want this cluttering up my desktop. <laughs> so, like, I don't want a VMware installation. I'm never going to use that. It's just going to cause problems for me. So, just put it all on my laptop. I don't care. <laughs> so, then I configured it all and now it works. And as of this morning, we have now this bootable little Samsung SSD, this little USB SSD that we can plug into either of our computers whenever a game comes along that we want to play. And we can just play it. I installed Steam and our, our account for Steam is already set up. And I, da- I already bought and downloaded inside. It's all ready to go. So Tiff can now play inside by plugging this into her computer and rebooting. And then when we're done, we can unplug it and put it in a drawer. And if I really need a disk for you know external use, if I'm going on a trip or something, I can just bring this disk and we have a disk. And afterwards, I don't have this giant game console collecting dust. I have this useful little external drive. So I'm reminded of what Tiff... Uh, told me when I was uh, telling her that she should uh, speed you along to get this done several days earlier instead of asking on Twitter and, and doing all this other stuff and not listening to the things that I already told you. You told her, <laughs> not me. She told you too. You live together. Anyway, do you know what she told me? <laughs> she said, this is what Marco does. You just have to let it run its course. <laughs> you both know me so well. You just have, this is what she said. You just have to let it run its course. Spoken like a woman who knows what she's dealing with. No one knows me better than her. <laughs> so it, it has run its course. You have you have acquired a new toy. You have read web pages about how to do something techy, and n- and now you are happy because you don't have an Xbox in the house, and you both have the capability to play Steam games. I just can't wait for you to be fighting over this. I guess you could just clone it at, at that point, but then you had to look up uh, Windows uh, disk cloning tools. I guarantee you, there will never be a time. When Tiff and I both at the same time want to play the same Windows game, <laughs> that's not you going should, to you happen. You should both play inside. It's fun. Although, yeah, <laughs> you can just watch her play. It'll be fine for you. Probably. That's all I'm going to want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I cannot believe you spent this much time on this. What, what, what is it you're supposed to be doing on Overcast that you're refusing to do or avoiding doing with such passion that you're writing Mac apps and installing Windows? A new watch app. Oh, from scratch for Watch OS three. That's what I have to be That's doing because right, you skipped a generation like Apple and their Macs. Yeah, because the generation <laughs> sucked. <laughs> Show me any Watch OS two developer who's like, I'm glad I did that. <laughs> I can't think of any. Underscore is glad. Is he? Now he has the experience. Now he can do watch apps in his sleep. He sneezes and a watch app comes out. <laughs> 